In the previous episode of this series, I completed the main assembly of the Spitfire FR Mark 14 in 148 scale from Airfix. Join me in this, the final part, where I paint, apply decals and complete my version of this historic aircraft. Hi, I'm Matt and you're watching Model Minutes. Before I start the video, honourable mention goes to my patrons. A massive thank you to you for the support you give my channel. Take a look at the links in the description on how to get involved and the exclusive perks you gain from pledging your support. So, the final episode of the Spitfire Mark 14 from Airfix. Just a reminder that Airfix sent this kit to me free of charge for the purpose of review. But all opinions are my own. As always, remember that adult supervision may be required due to the use of sharp tools and toxic paints and chemicals. Airfix recommends this kit for those aged 8 years and over. Picking up where I left off, the majority of the build is now complete. Some small details are still not on the model, but I'll add them after painting. The first step was to address the odd join between the fuselage and wings. I used Humbrol model filler to attempt to fix this. It was spread over the joins and allowed to dry. You have to be careful when using this kind of product to not lose the moulded details. I will end up going back over some of these details with a knife to make sure they aren't lost. When the filler is dry, it can be sanded smooth using some fine grade sandpaper. Humbrol 165 medium sea grey satin acrylic paint was thinned with Tamiya X20A acrylic thinners at a ratio of about two parts paint to one part thinner, but it wasn't precise and I used my eye to get the right consistency. A number of thin layers would be needed to get a good finish, but thinning the paint helps to avoid leaving brush strokes. The bottom of the aircraft received a number of layers of this paint, but I also painted the top surfaces with this, which would form a base layer for the next colour layers. I used a wide flat brush to get good even coverage. Humbrol 33 matte black acrylic was next to be used. Again, it was thinned with the Tamiya thinners, then using a thinner brush it was applied to the propeller blades, taking care to avoid the areas that were painted silver in the previous video. Again, a number of coats would be required. I then mounted some sprue into a suitable tool that could hold the wheels of the aircraft. The sprue, after being melted and cut to size, had a pointed end that could be inserted into the hole in the wheel. I can use this to hold the wheel whilst the tyre is painted with the same 33 matte black acrylic. This little handle allows me to rotate the wheel and get a fairly neat finish. Humbrol 24 Trainer Yellow Matte Acrylic was used on the spinner. This paint was also thinned to help it flow over the part and avoid leaving brush strokes. The next paint to be used was Humbrol 106 Ocean Grey Matte Acrylic, again thinned then applied to the entire top surface of the aircraft, taking care to avoid placing it on the lower surfaces which have already been painted. I did find that this particular paint was a bit grainy and wasn't happy with the finish, so before it had dried I washed this paint off using water. I did this off camera and will address the problem in a bit. With the paint on the propeller now dry, it was cemented to the back plate using Tamiya Extra Thin Cement. The spinner can then be cemented over the top. This was then followed by cementing the wheel hubs into the centre of the wheels. A small amount of cement was applied to the centre, then the hubs pressed into place. Now it's time to fix the top layer of paint. I've opted to replace the 106 Ocean Grey acrylic version with enamel. After thoroughly mixing the paint, it was thinned with white spirit and then painted over the entire top surface of the model. I would prefer to avoid enamels as they have much longer drying times, but I found that I had no choice seeing as my acrylic version was not good enough for this project. When this paint had dried, it was time to apply the green part of the camouflage scheme. I thinned the Humbrol 30 dark green acrylic with Tamiya thinners, then using a medium brush I followed the painting instructions by eye to apply the scheme. 33 matte black made a reappearance here 
and I used it to paint the previously unpainted gun sight parts in the cockpit. I did this very carefully using a fine brush to avoid placing the paint on the camouflage scheme or the pilot inside the cockpit. Humbrol 27002 polished aluminium metal coat was then used to paint the canopy frames. Again I took great care here using a fine brush to apply this paint. If I get it in the wrong place it will be a little difficult to remove. Here you can see that I've used Tamiya masking tape to mark out the areas on the leading edges of the wings that need to be painted yellow. I'm going to use Humbrol 24 Trainer Yellow for this job. Make sure you properly smooth the masking tape down to minimize the amount of paint bleed that could occur. The paint is then applied carefully to the correct areas. Whilst I've got this paint out, I'll paint the tips of the propeller blades as well. The tape was then removed when the paint had fully dried. Any areas of paint bleed can be addressed and covered up as necessary. Humbrol 135 satin varnish was thinned with a little water and then applied to the entire model. This will form the base layer for the decals. A gloss or satin base layer helps prevent the decals from silvering when they are applied. The correct decals are now cut from the decal sheet and the spare ones put into the spares box for potential use in future projects. The decal sheet is then cut up into more manageable sections. Sometimes I separate the decals into individual transfers. Other times I'll do it by sections depending on how many there are to apply and where they go on the model. The decals are then soaked in warm water and allowed to release from the backing paper. Humbrol decal fix is applied to the model in the relevant areas and this will help soften the decal when it is stuck to the model. The decal is carefully slid off the backing paper and positioned. A further layer of decal fix on top of the transfer will help soften it further and make it blend into the details and look painted on. It's worth noting that some decals need to be applied before others, such as the walkways before the roundels. This is to ensure that they don't overlap each other incorrectly. Make sure you pay careful attention to the instructions for this. Whilst you watch the completion of this step, I'll tell you a little about the actual Spitfire FR Mark 14. As the Second World War progressed and aircraft technology advanced, so too did the Spitfire in competition with its rivals in the conflict. To continue to maintain the edge over its enemies, it was continually updated and improved. The Mark 14 Spitfire increased upon the performance of the earlier versions through the use of the Rolls-Royce Griffin 65 engine and 5-bladed prop, increasing the top speed and climb rate of the machine. In 1944, a number of Mark 14s were converted to carry a fuselage-mounted camera which could face either port or starboard for the purpose of photo reconnaissance. Earlier photo reconnaissance versions of the Spitfire had their armament removed to increase speed and range and were designated PR. These Mark 14s, however, retained their two 50 cal machine guns and two 20mm Hispano cannons in the wings, allowing them to attack and defend themselves as necessary. The aircraft also featured the E type wing, which had the ends clipped in order to allow for superior low altitude performance. Due to the excellent performance of this version, many of these aircraft still saw service into the 1950s, even with the dawn of the jet age. At this point now, with the decals now applied and having cured, the entire model is given a coat of Humbrol 135 satin varnish, but this time it's the enamel version. You'll notice that my pot of paint has the wrong lid, and I've had to write on it to remind myself what it actually is. The paint was thinned with white spirit to help it flow. I'm using this enamel layer here as it will help protect the decals and previously painted acrylic layers in the next couple of steps. Here I'm just highlighting the cockpit area I'd not yet done with the polished aluminium metal coat. I took great care with a fine paintbrush to avoid placing it in the incorrect locations. 
Next, Citadel Non-Oil Acrylic Wash was then applied to all the details and recessed areas of the model. I did this carefully, trying to avoid placing too much wash on the unwanted areas. The excess wash can now be removed using a cotton bud soaked in acrylic thinner. I wiped the wash away and if you do this in the direction of airflow over the aircraft you can get quite realistic stains. The recessed areas retain the wash and are highlighted, whilst the raised areas have the wash removed and it results in a visible contrast. Had I not used the enamel varnish to protect the paint, all the previous acrylic layers would also be removed at this stage. Humbrol 49 matte varnish and 135 satin varnish acrylic paints were now mixed together with a little water. I found that the matte varnish on its own leaves an unwanted white residue as it dries. By mixing it with a small amount of the satin varnish, it prevents this, but it does still result in a reasonably matte finish. This was applied to the entire model to give it a uniform finish. The headrest support and fuel filler cap were now carefully added to the area behind the cockpit. This is a fiddly step, so tweezers and patience will be needed here. I've already given them a coat of polished aluminium. This was then followed by cementing the wheels onto the landing gear legs. Take care to get these on the right way round, as there is a flatter area on one side of the wheel, simulating the weight of the aircraft on the ground. The engine exhausts were then cemented into their slots on the nose of the aircraft. I did find that they didn't quite sit right, so a bit of filing and cleaning up was needed to get them to fit correctly. The windows that cover the camera on the fuselage sides can now be glued in place. I'm using a general purpose glue here to help avoid fogging the clear plastic up, which poly cement tends to do. Be careful though, as this type of glue does leave strings, so it will need attention as you apply it. I then repeated the process for gluing the two parts of the cockpit canopy into place. It's worth noting that you will have to glue the reflector gun sight clear part into place inside the cockpit before you put the front windscreen part on. Humbrol 53 gunmetal grey acrylic was used to highlight the barrels of the 20mm cannons. These protrude ever so slightly, so only a small amount was needed. I then dry brushed this paint over the exhausts of the engine to help dull them down and make them less shiny. 33 matte black was then dry brushed in various areas to simulate staining. I apply paint to the brush, then remove most of it before adding it to the model. I brushed the residue in the direction of the airflow around the cannons and guns to give the impression of gun smoke. This can be used in other areas such as the engine exhaust and anywhere there could be a leak of some kind. I repeated the dry brushing process but this time using the polished aluminium paint. I did this to represent chipped paintwork in areas of maintenance or moving parts such as the landing gear, control surfaces, panels and walkways. Humbrol 60 matte scarlet acrylic was used to highlight the navigation light on the port wing. I did this using a fine paintbrush. I then repeated the process for the starboard wing, but this time opted to use a generic light green acrylic paint from an art set. I didn't have a bright enough green colour in my modelling selection, so opted to use this instead. Humbrol 93 desert yellow acrylic was thinned with water to make it into more of a wash and then this was painted onto the tyres of the wheels. This is to simulate mud, as the aircraft has been taxiing through grass at the airfield. The excess was then carefully removed using a cotton bud. And it is this point now that I feel I have completed the model. This one depicts an aircraft flown by Squadron Leader Prendergast of 414 Squadron Royal Canadian Air Force in Germany, May to June 1945 but another decal option is included in the box for a silver version of the aircraft as used in 1950. So, what do I think of the Airfix Spitfire FR Mark 14 in 148 scale? Generally, it's a fantastic kit. The mould quality and details are good, the instructions are clear, and the decals are well printed and applied to the model well. I particularly like that it has a detailed cockpit and pilot, which is nice to see. 
The only thing that lets it down is the odd join where the wings meet the fuselage, and initially I thought it might just be my method of building it that resulted in the problem. I have since found out that I'm not alone in this issue, and it leads me to question why this problem exists in a product that was only released in 2019, being one of the more recent products from Airfix. There are a few other funny fitting parts too, like the engine exhausts, which needed a bit more sanding down to fit properly, which I wouldn't really have expected from such a new kit. It retails for £21 in the UK at the time this video was produced, and I feel that it is a reasonable price for this kit, but think that if you can get it cheaper, then you certainly should. As mentioned in my unboxing video, this was a pre-release promotional set which came with an included KitKat on a 3D printed sprue, and a humorous mention on how to eat your KitKat was included in the instructions. It's worth noting, however, that if you do buy a version in your local model shop or online, this item of confectionery will not be included, and you will have to go and buy your own, although other chocolate bars are available. In conclusion, this is a great kit of an interesting and iconic aircraft that is quite high quality, but is let down in places due to some strange fit issues. Ultimately though, I'm very happy with the results I've managed to achieve with my Airfix Spitfire FR Mark 14 in 148 scale. As always, let me know what you think of my build, techniques and finish model in the comments below, and don't forget that I'm eager to hear any suggestions you might have for other videos or builds you would like to see on my channel, so feel free to post that too. All that's left to say is thanks for watching this video, and I'll see you all on the workbench again next time.